Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of the ASLA Emerging Professionals Committee Ask Me Anything events. We are very excited to have you with us today. We have a little bit different thing going on today. Instead of just having a single guest where we discuss uh, their career and that sort of thing, we have uh, a couple of guests and uh, they are members of the ASLA LARE Prep Committee and we're going to be talking all things LARE exam today. Uh, so, all of you emerging professionals, students, those who are preparing for licensure and, uh, and starting off your career, join us, stick with us, use the comment section on uh, Facebook there to type in your questions uh, that you might have about the exam or anything that ASLA does uh, in relation to the exam, which you'll learn some of those things today. And we will get to as many of your questions as possible and help you out the best way that we can. My name is Daniel Martin. I am with Permalock Corporation. I am the chair of the Emerging Professionals Committee with ASLA and happy to uh, moderate and, and get things going for you today. Uh, let's introduce our guest and we're going to have them tell a little bit about themselves uh, and how they came about to be on this committee and, uh, and the work that they're doing there. So let's start with uh, Emily, Emily Mahoney. Uh, she is uh, from the Florida chapter and let me bring her up and introduce her to you guys. Sorry, here are doing things a little different with the multiple users. So. Uh, Little, little technical getting used to. Uh, Emily, welcome and uh, thank you for being with us. I'll we'll allow you to introduce yourself and, uh, and tell us uh, about yourself. Go ahead. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Emily O'Mahony. I'm with the firm of Gentile Glass Holloway O'Mahony, which sounds like a law firm, so we say 2GHO, in Jupiter, Florida, private private practice, variety of work. But I've been involved in my state chapter for many years. I've probably been organizing the review seminars for going on 20 years or more. Um, and in Florida, you know, we see, we see a, a lot of, of students. We are, the group of us who does this, uh, are your supporters going through the test and, and we're available to you. Um, so I finally signed up for the LARE prep committee and was selected to be on it last year. So I'm just starting my second year on it. And I sat through the annual event that this committee holds at the conference for the first time and was able to participate and see uh, what goes on. So. I think that pretty much says it about me. We probably move on to Angela now. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Angela Woodward with EMA Design. We too are a private practice. We do international, local. We're based out of California. And I have been on the Lair Prep Committee probably eight or nine years. I've been running the UCLA Stanton Lair review courses probably for nine years, give or take. And I'm really passionate about getting the many emerging professionals in our company, as well as throughout uh, the United States, become licensed. Uh, just a little factoid is in the state of California, there's only give or take maybe seven to eight thousand licensed landscape architects, but there are forty-six thousand licensed civil engineers. We have a long road ahead of us and want everyone to be licensed. All right, I, I, I don't know, I want to just say that on top of that, in Florida, we have a little over 1,000 licensed landscape architects and 16,000 registered um, engineers. So that's 16 times at least. I couldn't do your math fast <laughs> enough. At the same time, you know, we, we, you, Angela, and I are come from the same thing. We're very passionate about the profession and about getting you all licensed and uh, help you through that process. All right, so uh, let's uh, let's start there. So obviously we're talking about licensing and we're talking about the LARE. So 
Why don't one of you uh, tell us, for those that may not know, what is the LARE? Emily, why don't you go ahead and just kind of... Okay. Okay. Um, the LARE is the national exam written and um, given out by CLAR. Uh, Landscape Architecture Registration Exam is what LARE stands for. Um, it has been a national test, and it gives us much more um, validity as a profession to have a national exam. Um, and currently, you are licensed by the state, the state that you are applying for, and you are the exam is given by CLAR and graded by CLAR. Right. Angela, add to that. All right. It also is administered in Canada, and just for those even working overseas, overseas landscape architects come to California or to the United States to become licensed. Um, it has uh, four sections for the national exam, and then depending if you are within 34 states out of the 50, there is a fifth section of the exam. And that you will take from your state. But the first thing you have to do is go to CLAR, Council of Landscape Architecture Registration Board, CLARB.org, and figure out what the exam is all about. And then the next step would be to go to the ASLA website, ASLA.org, and they also have layer prep. And we will be populating that throughout the year. We keep we the whole committee, Emily, myself, and there's about another 15 of us all across the United States who volunteer our time. And even the exam writers of the license exam, they volunteer their time. And then you go to your individual state website to find out what they have. So. This isn't always covered in school or in your professional practice, and that's one of the things we want to start you on, is to get you going, where do I go at least to begin the process? Emily, you want to add more? Yeah. Right now, there's two different routes that your state will have. You're either going to go to the state and register to start the process there, or you're going to go to CLAR and register there, and you don't go to the state until you pass the exams. Um, there are some other extenuating circumstances, but more and more, CLARB is trying to be the central clearinghouse for you, the exam taker, so that you have a sort of a one-stop shop. If you are uh, a graduate or you, you don't have a degree in landscape architecture, there's a different process to follow depending on the states, and that's totally statewide. Um, but you would need then to go to your state first to be able to get permission to even contact CLARB, because CLARB is going to say, what school did you graduate from and all that. All right, so we have brought up, uh, you guys mentioned several differences in states as far as the order you do things and things like that. But as far as the test itself, is that the same in every state? Absolutely. Yes, yes it, is. it is. All four sections that are nationally administered are the same. Now, what we will tell you is they're the same content, but if you're sitting in the exam right next to another landscape architect, they mix the question order up. The information and the test questions are the same, but not the order. So darn, you can't <laughs> memorize the answer. <laughs> Very smart. So and and, and, they're, and they're offering three times a year to take the test over a two-week period. So that gives you several options um, and a lot of different strategies people have for how they sign up for it Okay. To take the test. Good to know. So it's not on demand like some other tests that uh, that people might be used to, like the like the lead AP exam, things like that, where you just take it when you mm -hmm. want. There are certain times that you need to sign up in advance for. Right, and you have to 
just so you know, you are making your um, time slot at the testing center, but you can't make it till you've been registered, and those time slots fill up. So as soon as it opens to register for the test, and you know you're going to take section one and two or whatever you're going to do, get registered with CLAR, and so that you can then set the days. Some people are going to want to take the test Monday and Wednesday and leave a day in between. Some people are going to want to do a separate week. Since it's open over two weeks, you can take one on one Monday and another one on another Monday. So it gives you a lot of options, but those options close down at the testing centers if you don't, you know, if you can get in there early. So you can do In other words, there, there are so many slots only available. And I, I, I want to clarify that you also, even if you go to Clark, you still need to check your state license for it because in the state of California, we start with our license, which is the Landscape Architect Technical Committee, and then they pre-qualify you, and then you can register with Clark. But so it, it's good. The, the bottom line is find out as much as you can on these three websites that we mentioned and start start your process for studying well in advance. The, the license exam is what I call an investment in you. You are the project with your deadline. And the more that you are prepared for it, the better you will do. Right. And Angela, does this yeah. mean if you pass this test that you're going to be a great landscape architect? No, it means you will be minimally competent. <laughs> and, but don't let that discourage you because it is your client that will pay for your design. And this brings up the other thing that we like to say. The exam is only testing health, safety, and welfare. And I call it people, plants, and things. So if you are a fantastic designer in school, but you don't know the health, safety, and welfare issues, you may struggle with the design section. And that's all that they can test you is health, safety, and welfare. The whole test. The entire test, all sections. Uh, one of the other, yeah, go on, Emily. No, no, no. I was just going to say, for example, um, you may be given solutions that you have to define what is the best solution. And one may be more aesthetically pleasing, but it has the potential to kill a pedestrian. <laughs> you know, you put conflicts of people and cars together. And take the aesthetics out of it. They, they can't judge and attest that kind of thing. And they don't want to. They want to test whether you can have clear, uh, safe circulation. Uh, you don't put plants that have that are thorns in a playground and or that are sappy. You know, I'm just using examples that come off the top of my head. But that's the kind of thing that they're looking for. That you can make those kind of decisions. And one of the um, one of the main guys that does the teaching, um, Tom Neiman. It makes a very good point. I think we made this this year. The test, as landscape architects, we have a broad knowledge base, very broad. And what happens is on this test, Clark keeps reevaluating and say, ooh, landscape architects need to know even more, which means the depth of that knowledge gets less over, over time as we've done it. So we, are, we need to know and understand a lot of things but not to a real deep depth of how, you know, the details of it. Um, you bring I'm up, paying on that. Yeah, yeah. Daniel? Uh, I was just going to say that brings up a, a point. Um, you know, they, obviously the test, they can't judge design, and aesthetics, and things like that. How is the test administered, and then how is it graded? It is administered through a testing center. I forget the name of it, and Pierce. it's all computerized, but it's not by CAD drafting. 
So you might have uh, a problem. Are, are we? There are four types of questions: multiple choice, multiple response, drag and drop, and hot spot. And sections one and two. One is professional practice and construction administration. Two is analysis. Site inventory and analysis. Right. Those two are all multiple choice questions, are multiple response. Section three, design, has what we call all four options, which is you will be actually given a little site plan vignette, and you will be asked to select at the answers. The good news is, on every problem, the answers are already there. You don't have to come up with them. You have to know them. <laughs> and then you want to talk about four, Emily? Section sure, four. Four has all, four has all um, parts of it also, the drop and drag and hot spots. Um, and four has traditionally been the hardest, though I have to say since they now computerize section three and four, that the pass rates have actually gone up. Um, a lot of people say they find it easier, especially when you get out in the workplace and you're working mostly on computers. Some of us are losing our hand drafting skills, which, which caused people problems to work fast when we had to draw, but that, that's no longer anyway. So what about section four? All right. Gradient and Yeah. All right, we do have our first audience question, so I'm going to throw that to you real quick, and then we'll go on to some of the other stuff. Um, question came in right. from came in from Ian. Uh, he asked, "Why doesn't CLARB offer you a comprehensive score after passing passing an exam instead of just a pass mark? It would be great to know how well you did." Any insight there? Good luck, that belongs at Clark, not here. <laughs> I, I, so, I, if we're minimally competent, we only have to meet um, a basic standard. So if I were to guess, it, it, is, it puts us all on an even basis. Could you imagine the advertisement after you pass the license exam? Oh, I scored 96%. The, the bottom line is we're all licensed and we're on an equal footing to begin the rest of our career. All right. Fair enough. Uh, we have been talking about sections, uh, you know, four in most states, five in some. Uh, what is the best strategy for taking these sections, take them all at once, take them in any particular order, uh, time frame for them. What are your suggestions for that? You want to start? You want to start first? Uh, oh, well, I'll start. Okay. Okay. Um, in our review courses, we have I have a few people that swear by taking all four sections at once. However, the people that have done this have studied for six months or more to take the license exam. And what they like by going through all four sections is there's a lot of overlap. That's one method. Another method, which it seems to me more and more uh, emerging professionals are doing, is taking one section at a time or taking a year, all three exams. And to me, taking a year to pass a license exam is doable. You could go combine one and two sections or two and three. Or some people said combine one and four and then take two or three. But the big process is once you start the exam, keep going. Don't stop. Just to keep the synergy of what you learn. And don't go on the 10-year plan. Oh, I'll take a section two years. It's not efficient and a good use of your time and of your study, your studying efforts. 
Emily, what do you um, think? I, I will agree. Clark has put out that um, they have it on their website. Take one and two as soon after school as you want, as you can. Um, take three when you feel you're ready and take four after you've had some experience. Yet I have heard them say, and it's not on their website right now, that basically try and take them all as soon as possible after school. And as soon as possible means, you know, spread it out over the year, but start it right after school. Start it right on the end of school, as soon as school as um, school's out as possible. Uh, they're finding better success rate. And just in general, if you wait, you know, the chances are you're going to get married, you might have kids, um, you have a whole lot more to life that if you can take it as soon after school, um, you have less taking away from your time. And it, it definitely, everyone I've talked to who has great success passing it, they committed time to the study. They, you know, whether they take one or two, I mean, you can take all four sections in a two week period and be putting them three days apart. So, I mean, it's not like you're jamming it into to two days. So you have a lot of options. So one of the uh, possible drawbacks to that uh, or, or things that you hear is, um, is price and cost. Um, I, I understand that the mm -hmm. test is quite expensive and, and that can be maybe a drawback to a young student. Um, what do you know the cost and, and what is the, the best way to tackle that? I know okay. in Florida about about mm -hmm. 2400 something like that to take all the tests one time and, and all the application fees. Um, I always recommend there are some companies that will pay for taking the test. There are some companies will pay if you pass the test. There are companies that give you a raise when you pass the test. And I think almost any company, if you need help with that money right then, that you could work out something in your pay that they can front you some money and work that out. Um, do most, most of our companies really want to support us. And so some of it is just asking. How it can be the started. other thing, I want to point out is the architecture exam, the civil engineering exam are more expensive. Oh. And once you're licensed, ASLA has done a study and found that over the life of your career, a licensed individual gets earns 30 to 40 percent more than an unlicensed individual. You you have to budget it if you plan, if you plan your study. And there are, there are many ways to study. We, we can go through those processes. But if you plan your project, you plan your study, you plan and are motivated. The single reason people pass the exam is motivation. And you want to, you want to take the exam and get it complete in the exam cycle. We just began a new exam cycle in 2017. And Clark reevaluates with a task analysis every five to seven years. So we started in 2017. So I suggest that before what 2000, what 20, 20, 22, yeah, that you have completed this cycle. I just went to an event with a lady who was with me in one of my review courses. She started in 2016 and because of health reasons, could not finish one section. She took it into 2017 series and now she's on her third time taking design. And the good thing is she's motivated. She contacted me and said, hey, can you help me? What, what am I doing? I've read the book. I'm, you know, anything. And we talked and we found some of the missing pieces. But the critical thing is perseverance, motivation, seek help, study group. You're investing in yourself. Great. That Anything actually else? 
um, brought up a question from our audience. Fits in kind of good with that, with the cycle thing. Um, Mark asked, how do you know you're studying the right material? I bought some guides and pra practice exams when I graduated in 2010. Are they still relevant for today's test? <laughs> Excuse me when I laugh. <laughs> okay, first of all, you need to go to CLAR and download the outline for each section because some of the material has changed. They really don't tend to take much out, but they expand on it. And if the test samples that you took, you can take them. It's great practice. And there's a lot of stuff that we still need to know. But there's no guarantee, you know, at that point. You need to understand where Clark is coming from first. So when you take all these old tests, you understand what you're gaining from it. Okay, so you understand, okay, I know that I still need to understand this kind of element. But, uh, okay. Then down... Uh, go, yeah, Clark website has a list of reference books, and then they also, when you go into some of their tabs, they have exam specifications, and then they have another task analysis result, which explain where, what the landscape architects are expected to know. One of the good things to do is to read the overall specifications. And they're expanded. So if you looked at what the specifications were for 2010, and that is three exam cycles ago. So Emily is correct about the basic knowledge is right, but as she referred to Tom and myself, it's expanded now. Sustainability, planning, performance landscape, landscape maintenance, these are things that we do now every day, and you're asked questions about them, but they weren't talked about in 2010. Because I was, well, you were teaching review courses then too, Emily, in 2010. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I think that no, it's, it's, more relevant. This is the first time I, I've seen much, a, a much broader scope, and it's really. Stronger than I've seen at other times. The other times it's like changing format and doing some things. It, the, the content didn't seem as strong a change as it has this time, in my opinion. Right. And the old adage, divide and conquer, study group. Even as we're doing a web, webcam here, study group with people even in different parts of the country. And coming up with other questions. And the biggest thing, too, is if you don't understand a word or a concept, look it up. What you're going to be tested on. You, you need to understand, I guess, holistically the use of items. All right. Um, so we have talked about uh, a few organizations, uh, CLARB and, of course, ASLA. So, how do these organizations relate to each other? What does ASLA have to do with Larry and Clarb? We want to tackle that just to distinguish the differences. Clarb is a separate organization. We are not in in line. They are charged with preparing the license exam. They have licensed landscape architects who write the exam. Then they have professional um, test psychometricians who look at the questions and see if the questions worded and correct with the test examination, and they administer the exam. Then ASLA, which has landscape architects, is charged, you know, we're the professional society, we're advancing the profession, we, we have landscape architects on multiple committees which Daniel, Emily, and I are all on, out of which we all volunteer our time to advance uh, emerging professionals get them licensed. Great. Um, Emily, what did I forget? 
No, no it's, it's, it's sort of interesting, interesting to note that Clark's Clark board is the board representative from every licensed state. That's who comprises and basically runs Clark, per se. So it's, that's intertwining the licensing boards with writing the test. And ASLA has always just been a partner in tackling things. And, um, you know, there's a Clark member that sits on the LARE prep committee. So, you know, we, they can't say much to us about you know, detailed stuff, but uh, they're on our committee. committee. Uh, and, you, you know, know there's, there's a good, good interaction between them, them but they, they are completely separate. Oh. And explain yeah. uh, why it's important to ASLA to have this committee and why do we care so much about the LARE and making sure that our emerging professionals are prepared for it and, and are taking it and passing it. You want to add a lot to this family? Yeah, because yeah, Lincoln Architects don't have anything, anything better to do than to volunteer their time to help bring forward a competitor. We sort of said that both Angela and I and anyone that I've come across who does the review seminars and, and helps, we have a passion for the profession and we have a passion to see the emerging professionals succeed. So, you know, to be part of this, you know, exciting career. Right. So, and the reality, the reality of it is, we, as I talked with some landscape architects, they said we've been sustainable since, what, 1886 when our profession was formed, but we don't promote ourselves. And we're the one of the only professions that understand, as I say, from below the ground to way above the ground, how everything interconnects. And we can lead a multi-jurisdictional profession because we understand so many things. So someone has to be out there promoting. And my philosophy has always been the more landscape architects we have, even if you don't practice, the better off both our environment, sustainability, and life will be for all of us. Yep. Here, here. Absolutely. And and licensure, obviously, you know, the, the test is, is what gets you licensed, and licensure is very important to ASLA um, to, I guess, uh, I want to say legitimize the profession, even though it doesn't need to be legitimized, but in people's eyes, the importance of the profession. Yeah. and. And uh, if I am correct, we are, Landscape Architecture is one of only like 66 professions that are licensed in all 50 states. Does that sound correct to you guys? I've never known that. But uh, you, you bring up something excellent, Daniel, is it puts you on a professional parity with a civil engineer, with an architect. I have architects who literally say, hey, if I see out of the building, it's yours. I have civil engineers who have said to me, you know grading pretty well. They don't take grading courses. No. But it's the same, we need a parity. <laughs> right, and from the other side, you see engineers, uh, the civil engineer and part of engineering, Grabbing, okay, okay now, now we have sustainable engineers. engineers. And, and now, now we have this, I see that big group, like, they, they, they said, oh, sustainability is a big word now. So they're, they're grabbing for it. And if you can't, a lot of our state agencies, and I assume that's sort of across the board, because I see it federally too, will say licensed professional are the people who can go after this kind of work. And if we're not licensed, then we are no longer on par with civil engineers um, for doing any kind of site work. It's the way it is. Right. Okay, so I'm an emerging professional and I want your help to, uh, to pass this exam. Where do I go? What do I do? ASLA has a website that which has information on it, 
including uh, you know, what states require licensure and what's going on with that, but it also has all these study um, events that people turn in. So you can find out if Florida has theirs listed. Um, and of course, this group does the, the event at conference every year. So you can always know that in the fall, you can get that. The second place to look is at your state chapter and say, do you have a study course going on? And, and uh, they should be able to answer that. All right. By conference in the fall, you were talking the ASLA annual meeting. There is a study Correct. prep there. Correct. Okay. All right. Which is in, in all Philadelphia day. this year in October. They, 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 they do an all, it's all morning, so it's like four hours in the morning of just section four, which is gradient and drainage, and then an afternoon session, which is more general and how to take, and uh, we try and get some people there that or recent test takers to share their experiences. Right. Typically, the reason we do offer um, the section for grading, grading, and construction documentation for four hours is it's one of the longer sections. I think it's like it's, it's four hours. You are sitting four hours without getting up, without leaving. You have four hour time. If you go to the restroom, they, they don't stop the exam for you. Um, it is still one of the hardest things for landscape architects to pass, but one of the most beneficial to me is the grading and drainage. So that's a four hour intensive review. And you know, I'm not plugging it, mean, I am plugging it, but only because so much material. Afternoon is geared for those that, oh, I'm just starting. What do I need to do? What do I need to go for? How do I need to figure out what what do I what are my weaknesses? And we also talk about how to begin a study group, how to begin studying. Because there are strategies on how to maximize your time. So we talk about those a lot of those in the afternoon. In the morning, it's very intensive construction documents all the way to grading and drainage. Uh, once you've been to the morning section, you have a very good idea if you're ready for the exam or if you need to study more. And again, to what, Philadelphia next year? Or right. yep. the, state, the, the national meeting is in Philadelphia. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. national meeting is in Philadelphia. Yep. So if you already didn't have a good enough reason to go to the annual meeting and you're, you're an emerging professional, here's, a, here's another good reason. Uh, we do have a couple more audience questions, so let's hit those real quick. Uh, Remy says, how portable is the license? If you plan on moving and practicing in a different state in the next few years, is it worth starting the process? Absolutely. I can have it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, we, uh, yes, that's the, the, the short answer is correct, yes, for both of us. Uh, typically, if, if you get licensed through Clark, and which you do, um, if you, uh, you, can, you can get licensed in any state you want. If you live in California, and you want to get licensed in Arizona, and then start in Arizona, and because you know you're moving to Arizona, and you can get licensed in Arizona while living in California. Oh, that brings so up. Able, yeah, yeah. On. The, the, since I, that brings up a question. Uh, so many of our firms now are working, you know, around the country, around the world. Do you have to be licensed in multiple states to do that? To run projects in different states? Yes. If, if you're, if you're yeah, not national, but, 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 but you do um, have to have the controlling entity somehow has to be licensed to practice. In, it's usually five person there. So a lot of the architects have multiple licenses. And because of the professional practice, that is one of the questions is, if you are overseeing a project and you are signing a plan, you need to be licensed in that state. Yep. So I had two licenses, 
And how many do you have? I just, I just have, have one. So, so but and, and what, what happens, happens is in Florida, Florida you have a, set, a separate section to take. So I have that. If, if I, I go, go to another state, state Florida has all my records. So, so it's easy enough to send my information to the to the state to get reciprocity. But if that state requires a special test, I will still be responsible for that test. And each state comes with its continuing education requirements in general. Do all states have a continuing education? No, they do not. Okay. No. California does not, but Florida. Oh yes. They're, they're more, uh, you should keep yourself educated as a part of your business professionalism, but it's not legislated. Gotcha. I think well, Michigan it's is just out of it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you are correct. All right. We have one more audience question here uh, from Chris. Is there any good outside source for study material? Where would you recommend? Well, don't you say take, take anything, take, take everything, everything with a grain of salt, unless unless it's recommended, recommended by far. I mean, there's there's, there's some, some people that say, I only study this. Well, you're, you're taking chances. You know huh. that there's there's fallacies in it. I I like that answer that you said, Emily, because the reference book that Clark has. If they have a topic in there that you don't understand, you need to take it and expand it a little more. But can we recommend sources? Those you have to evaluate based upon what are your skills, what do you know best, and yes, take them with a grain of salt because some is good, but there are some of the sources, the, the answers might be correct, but I, I, you know, I can't say that um, because Emily and I cannot take the current exam. <laughs> There's something about it that's separate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the question. <laughs> yeah. Is there official CLARB study, study guides? Like if you go on the CLARB website, can you purchase study guides from them? Uh. uh Currently, do they, they offer they offer a couple questions on each section? I think. Okay. Just, but I don't, I don't just mean some sample questions. Now. They've, They've gone, gone through different stages of what they offer. Okay. Um, right. Uh, and uh, but I do want to say, uh, um, ASLA has some of uh, yeah. is a repository of some of these items, but don't be. Um, taken aback by the cost of some of the books on Clark's website because you can get those through the library, which is part of the planning. Or if you're going through a study group, maybe you've got six people and each one buys a different book and you share them. Be creative. But that's the best source for um, an official content. And, and, and don't read everything. Don't, don't, don't read a book from cover to cover and say, this is a book that Clara recommended. You need to use these resources to supplement the knowledge you have. And if there's phrases that you don't understand or you don't, like let's say, for example, you don't, you're not real clear on going through the bidding process and taking a project through then use the resources for specifically that element. You don't need to clog your mind with everything else. You need to understand the simple, keep it as simple as possible. You need to understand that big picture and how all the pieces go together. And if you get so down into the, you know, minute details of who can sue who for what, you know, that's not where they're going. They just want to know who's liable, who's, Who's responsible? Whose job is it to do such and such? And in what order does it go? All right. Great advice. Um, how well do you think the universities are preparing students for these exams? Uh, 
obviously, I don't. There's not direct, you know, LARE classes where you're just <laughs> studying what's going to be on these exams. But uh, do you think, in general, when a average landscape architecture student graduates, they already have the majority of knowledge that they need? Don't both jump at once. <laughs> it's a loaded yeah, question, huh? I'm sure uh, every program is different. Um, I, I think they're given a lot, whether they, well, first of all, taking it soon after college helps retain some of the stuff that you may not be using right away. Um, you know, if you get out in the workplace and you're only doing one aspect of landscape architecture, it's easy to forget some of those other things. Not to say that, you know, you go into the test well-rested and well-studied, well-rested meaning you can think correctly, you can logically be presented with a problem and think through it. Um, you know, I think it's hard to tell from school to school whether they're prepared. I mean, if you are not a good test taker, that's a problem too that you have to deal with. Do you overcompensate? Do you overanalyze, you know, what kind of questions throw you. So there is part of what you have learned that pertains to landscape architecture, but there is still a test. Uh -huh. um, what I'd like to add on to this is you are responsible to go and see the exam specification content. You are responsible to see, did you learn this in school? Did the school and that is, is for you to determine what else do I need to study. Most people study for the license exam. We did. I took a review course. Um, and um, that's, that's what I say. Are the schools lacking? No. It is up to you what did you retain. You are a unique individual. You study different. There are some things you're interested in, so you study those harder. There are other things you're not, as some people say, I'm never going to use that. Why did I have to study it? Because a competent landscape architect needs to know that. But we cannot evaluate any of the schools, period. Yep, <laughs> yep. so it's the, the practical things that you're learning, the practical things that are required to perform the job of a landscape architect that are important for this exam. Health, health safety, welfare. There we go. The, the root of it. All right. We and have planning is a part of health, safety, and welfare. All right, one more audience question kind of goes along with the, uh, the study uh, continuation on that. Uh, with the recommended reading, they are so broad. Is there a good resource to study or a way to prepare for the test? I think we've covered some of that in uh, talking about the, the classes at the annual meeting and some of the local chapters also do, do study groups. Um, anything else you want to add to that on where to, to study or get additional resources besides CLARP? I personally think that, that people, you should reach out to other people who are in your position. A lot of people can't um, study with other people, but sometimes reviewing things with other people actually highlights, you talk through what is the right answer. And by talking it through, it actually sticks in your mind. People all study differently, but there are lots of options to meet up with people, especially with our technology today, to be able to study, you know, it's much more open than it was when I took the test. So. Does ASLA National or maybe either one of your chapters that you know of from experience uh, offer any sort of way for people to link up like that? Like, hey, I'm, I'm in Boston and I'm taking the test uh, in, in a few months. Anybody else, you know, is, do you know of any way to hook up with other people to study? We we do some people. Oh, we do some. We recommend they get with their section chair. We have sections in Florida, 
and see if they know of anyone locally. But now with technology, you don't have to be someone who lives 10, 10 miles away from you. True. No, that's, uh, we know the uh, Southern California chapter uh, to go from one end to the other, like Florida, it, it, even just in one chapter. But some people go on the Google route. I, I don't know how it works for them, but I do know that you know, Emily's way advertising or sending it to your chapter secretary or some an officer saying, hey, I'm looking for someone to study with. That's a good way to start, or even if the chapter has any resources, because the chapters are all, you know, they're, they're all different, again, as to what they keep in their records, and um, whether they offer review courses or not. Some chapters do, some leave it up to the universities. All right, uh, I'm going to uh, offer each of you a chance here, and uh, we'll start with Emily, um, to have any kind of closing remarks. Um, actually, we'll, one sec, before we do that, we got one final question here from the audience we'll take, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll offer you a chance. I'll give you a, a heads up so you can think about it in the background. Um, to offer any last minute words of advice or encouragement or any last minute thing you'd like to say to those who uh, are, are looking to take this test in the near future. Um, but let's take this last question from the audience from Christopher. Um, if you have previously passed exam sections since migrating to four part exam version, is there an expiration or duration on completing all four parts? Um, does Pearson view offer exams if you're overseas for work or does exam have to be completed stateside? There you go. So two part question. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, you, you asked ask the, the, the second part. part. The second part, I would think you have to ask for about that. I don't think we have the knowledge about taking it overseas. All right. Um, and the first part was what Angela you got. Well, okay, on the first part, did, did you take it? Um, when it was five sections, and now it's only four. Yeah, let's uh, let's see how. I'm not sure how fast he'll be able to respond to that, but uh, if he does, so I'll, I'll get you that information back. It sounds like that could be the case because uh, he's saying since it migrated to four part. So does he have? Okay. And then he, I guess he's kind of yeah. asking, and this might be a question too. Is okay. So I so I completed two parts. Do I have to complete the, the additional parts within a certain period of time, or are they good forever until I do complete the other ones? I think that might be more what he's asking. If he didn't take, if there was, Clark notified you if you were like in a, if you had passed section C, but C did not directly correlate to section 3. Then you were notified, and you were given a, like a chance to completely pass, you know, the sections that would make it to you didn't have to. He should know if he has to take them. As far as taking the new ones, and if there's a light on it, I thought I heard something, Angela. I mean, okay, I didn't tell now, but I I heard that. Okay, uh, the the. The best way is to check with your state license board and with CLAR. The only thing we can tell you is if you wait long periods of time between taking the section, particularly every five years to seven, the exam changes, your knowledge base for the new section is you're increasing the amount of studying you're having to do. There's synergy of studying for everything together because as in life, there's overlap. And don't, uh, I believe in some states it was that five years was the expiration date. So you have to check your state. You have to, you have to do your homework. But the bottom line is protect your investment. Your time is your investment. If you go for the licensure, license exam, keep going. I I know one gentleman graduated with me. Yeah, graduated with me. He did not practice landscape architecture in quite some time. 
He still pays his licensing. He's not going to let it last. It is very valuable. You are a professional, and you can do this. I, I will say, uh, not not a plug, but uh, my company's owner is a landscape architect. Uh, obviously, started a manufacturing company. hasn't practiced landscape architecture in quite a while, but he also maintains his license every year, and that's very important to him. So, yeah, that's solid advice. All right, we have reached the top of the hour, so let's get back to uh, start with Emily. Any closing comments, words of advice, encouragement, anything you'd like to offer to our viewers? Uh, no, I, I just wish everyone the best that, that uh, you go for the test, you study for it, and you do it as soon from this point, as soon as possible, as long as you're graduated from uh, college and I just I think it's uh, you know to, you've chosen a great profession and it really really helps to be licensed and from a standpoint of view of an employer I'm the first one to tell you to get licensed and I want you licensed I need to be able to put licensed landscape architects on uh, jobs that we chase on public jobs and stuff like that rather than a landscape designer I need mean landscape architects someone with the after the name that says they're licensed. So I just encourage you and just know that at ASLA, we, we are there to answer questions um, anytime you can get through us through the landscape, uh, through the LARA prep committee, you can get to us. All right, thank you. And uh, Angela, same thing to you. I. Uh, I will second Emily, as soon as your state allows you to get licensed, please go ahead, get it done, get it finished. Um, if you don't want to wait until the downturn in the economy to get licensed, uh, I do second that with Emily on being licensed, we only allow licensed landscape architects to go out to construction sites. Uh, it is a marketing effort. It is also a way to distinguish yourself from the others out there. It's a way to show you're motivated. You are committed to your career. We're professional. This, um, you graduate from college, or you will soon, you can get licensed. Uh, that's the myth that so many people say how hard it is. Don't psych yourself out. You've got your degree, you can become licensed. And yes, go to asla.org and clark.org. That's my closing. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, to you, Emily, and to you, Angela, for joining us and sharing your insight and knowledge on behalf of the LARE Prep Committee. Uh, thanks so much for helping out the Emerging Professionals Committee. It's all teamwork here. Uh, thank you to our viewers, all of you, for joining us and, and viewing. Um, for those of you who are emerging professionals or students who will be taking this test uh, soon, make sure that you tell your friends about this. Uh, they can go back to ASLA's Facebook page and watch this at any time. Send them links, share it, get the word out. Uh, and Be sure to join us next month second Tuesday of every month. We do these Ask Me Anything events and uh, we'll be announcing our guest and getting the word out on that very soon. So with that, we will sign off and all of you have a wonderful day. Thank you.